Uh, my name is Rodney Kite Powell, and I am the director of the Touchton Map Library here at the Tampa Bay History Center. And it is my pleasure to, uh, to welcome you all here this evening to hear a really interesting talk uh, by Dr. David Barclay. Uh, just before we, st we start that, as we always do, just want to talk a little bit about what is coming up, so the things that we've got in the hopper. Uh, of course, this is a Florida Conversation, which is uh, done in partnership with the University of South Florida's libraries, uh, also with the USF Public Media and AARP Tampa Bay. So I want to make sure we give those people our thanks. And in future Florida Conversations for the rest of the sp spring, we have on March 23rd, The Origins of Tampa Bay, uh, which is at Whedon Island over in St. Petersburg. On April 3rd, we have a history of Tampa's streetcar, which would be really interesting to, to hear about. And then the last one for the season is June 6, which uh, will have uh, Fred Hearns and several others talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In addition, on April 23rd, we have our annual Duckwall Lecture, and that will be uh, Gary Ellis, who is an archaeologist who has done extensive uh, research, archaeological research with his team up at Chinsegat, which is uh, our uh, little uh, branch up in Hernando, Hernando County, and he has found some really interesting things that relate to the very early uh, history of Chinsegat as a um, birth as the plantation, but also potentially uh, before the building was built as a uh, possible Seminole village uh, site, or at least a Seminole site. So uh, come to the History Center on April 23rd, and you can hear Gary talk about all of that. But you all are here to talk about, or to hear about, David Barclay. Uh, I will say that um, uh, after Dr. Barclay's talk, uh, we would love to hear any questions that you all have. Uh, we are, in addition to being live here at the History Center, we also are live on Zoom. Uh, and this will be available also on YouTube afterwards. You all can watch this, or those uh, who aren't able to, if you, if you want to tell, tell a friend to go to our YouTube station, you can see this on, uh, on video. But we want to make sure that your questions here are available for everybody who's watching at home to see. So uh, please wait for me to come to you with the microphone, and you can ask your question on the microphone. For those who are uh, watching live via Zoom, you can use the chat feature, and uh, we'll be able to get, uh, get to your question that way as well. So with all of that out of the way, I will introduce Dr. Barclay. Uh, David E. Barclay was born in Tampa and grew up in St. Petersburg. He earned his uh, bachelor's degree in history from the University of Florida, go Gators, and he went to a lesser school, Stanford University, uh, for his PhD. Uh, he taught modern European history with an emphasis on German history at Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo College in Michigan for 43 years, from 1974 to 2017, and was the executive director of the German Studies Association from 2006 to 2020. Uh, he is the author or co-author of five books in English and German, and he is currently writing a history of West Berlin during the Cold War, which of course uh, is the brackets of years of 1945 to 1994. But his talk today is much more personal. Uh, it's about his family and about how in our modern times uh, we can kind of deal with and uh, kind of reconcile uh, the Confederate ancestors that we may have in our family. So without further ado, Dr. David Barclay. Thank you very much, Rodney, and thanks for coming out this evening. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. I, uh, I feel very much at home in this room because uh, I grew up going to the Valencia Garden restaurant with my grandparents for many, many years, and so I, I, I vividly remember the Harry Bierce paintings or murals from, from those days. Um, I'd like to begin my talk tonight with three caveats, if you will. My first caveat is that my John Jackson, whom I'm going to be talking about tonight, is not the famous John Jackson. If you've read, uh, if you've read Grismer's book or if you've read Cantor Brown's book, you know that the famous John Jackson uh, was an Irish immigrant who was an engineer and surveyor and platted out the streets of uh, downtown Tampa. Uh, that is not my uh, John Jackson. Uh, my John Jackson is a different one. And you see him here in this photograph with his three brothers and uh, his mother. Uh, his mother there is my great-great-grandmother, uh, Nancy Collar Jackson. 
And uh, from left to the right um, is uh, Uncle Bill, uh, William P. Jackson, who was a steamboat captain, among other things. Uh, I knew his son, my grandfather's cousin, Preston Jackson, uh, quite well. And I, also, I didn't know his sister, uh, or the daughter of Captain Bill, um, Mary Jackson, but he was close to my grandfather. She was close to my grandfather as well. She got married to Grady Lester, and I knew their daughter, uh, Martha Lester Nelson, uh, quite well, who lived on Davis Island. Then to Nancy Jackson's, to her left, is Uncle Bob, uh, Robert Jackson the Younger, uh, who for a number of years was the sheriff of Hillsborough County. And as I gather, and Rodney can correct me here, a rather controversial one uh, from what I understand. Uh, and I always thought that he looked for all the world like Wyatt Earp, so he should be a sheriff. And then uh, finally, on the right, our protagonist this evening, John B. Jackson. That uh, photograph that we saw was taken, I suspect, around 1895. Um, on the porch of Nancy Jackson's house at 205 Platt Street. And uh, well, there he is again. And there's another view of it, uh, the whole house taken on the same occasion with Nancy Jackson and her four sons uh, sitting there. Oh, I neglected to mention the second from the left. That was Uncle Oscar, um, who spent most of his life living in Bainbridge, Georgia. And here we are, it's a close-up of the same thing. There's Uncle Oscar on the top and Uncle Bill on the right, and then Uncle John, our subject for tonight, on the right again, and Sheriff Bob uh, sitting in the front. Um, so that was my first caveat. My John Jackson is not the famous John Jackson. My second caveat is that, although, as Rodney kindly pointed out, uh, I taught college history for 43 years, as he also noted, my field is modern European history with a specialization in modern German history. I am a professional historian, but when it comes to the history of the South, the history of Florida, the history of the Civil War, uh, I am an admitted amateur. So please do bear that in mind. And my third and final caveat, before I really get started, is that... Uh, in my, this is a talk that's going to be divided into three parts. If any of you took high school Latin, you may remember reading Julius Caesar, who told us that all Gaul is divided into three parts. Well, the same is true of my talk tonight. Um, in the first part, I will describe a kind of history detective story, my attempt to reconstruct the life of John B. Jackson. In the second part, I will speculate on why John Jackson did what he did, though this will involve some guesswork on my part. Third, and more controversially perhaps, I'll talk about the question posed in the title of this talk. What do we make of all this, and why should we care? In view of our present historical circumstances, how do we deal with our Confederate ancestors? After all, Hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Americans are descended, as I am, from people who fought to leave the Union, people who fought to break up the United States, as it was at least at that time. In other words, we might pose our problem this way. When I was teaching, I always used to tell my students that when you study history, when you read a historical text or anything like that, Whenever we concern ourselves with the past, we should ask ourselves three questions about that, and I will try to do so this evening. The first question is the what question. The second question is the why question. And most importantly, and controversially, the third is so what. And we'll try to do that in the time that's available to us this evening. So let's start with the what part. And I'm going to be a little personal in this, as Rodney suggested. Let's start around 1960 or 1961. Um, at my grandparents' house, 
They lived on 110 South Albany Avenue here in Tampa. Those of you who have spent many years in Tampa or who grew up here will recognize, probably re recognize the neighborhood. It was right off of what was then Grand Central Avenue. On the corner was Al Sedita's appliance store. Right next to it was Louis Sedita's cafe. On the same side of the street was a toddle house restaurant. Across the street was the Orange Pharmacy. And especially exciting for a kid who was 12 or 13 years old at that time, there was the Sportatorium, the home of championship wrestling from Florida, and the legendary wrestling announcer, Gordon Soley. That was what interested me when I was 12 or 13. My grandfather, Arthur Jackson Barkley, who had worked in Tampa, he was a civil engineer who worked as assistant city engineer here for many years. My grandfather liked to reminisce, as grandfathers like to do. And he told me on several occasions about his favorite uncle. And this was Uncle John, John B. Jackson. He told me that Uncle John lived as a kind of hermit. That he lived in what, in what I gathered from what my grandfather said, he lived in what seemed to be a kind of palmetto shack uh, on Rocky Point, where he would be far away from other people. What he would make now of uh, jet ski rentals and so on is hard to imagine. Um, there, my grandfather explained, Uncle John mostly liked to spend his time fishing. Indeed, my grandfather said his angling skills were prodigious. And in those days, old Tampa Bay must have been a paradise in any case for anglers. My grandfather continued that Uncle John was friendly enough, everybody liked him, but he liked to be by himself. And so at the age of 12 or thereabouts, I asked my grandfather, I said, well, why did Uncle John live like that? And my grandfather's answer was that he was, quote, a little funny in the head, unquote. Well, I was always a little puzzled by that and a little bit curious about Uncle John. Many years later, long after my grandfather had passed away, I discovered that Uncle John had served in the Confederate Army and in the Confederate Navy and had seen big time combat in both. Of course, I immediately thought PTSD. But I could not prove that, nor will I ever be able to do so. But the historian in me got intrigued. As far as I know, we never had any letters from Uncle John. I do know that he was literate. Indeed, there are thousands upon thousands of letters from Civil War soldiers on both sides. Uh, the Civil War was one of the first wars in human history waged by soldiers who in many numbers were at least functionally literate. And so, and right they did. So for whatever reasons, we have no letters at all from John B. Jackson. So I thought it would be interesting as a kind of side hobby detective story to see how much of his life I could reconstruct in the absence of letters. My model for this exercise was a brilliantly innovative French historian, one of the most uh, innovative historians of our age, a man named Alain Corbin, like, like Corbin. Uh, who, among other things, wrote a powerful biography about an illiterate 19th century French shoemaker who left no personal records of any kind at all. And he still was able to write an extraordinary biography of this guy. So I set out to see what I could find. And I did find things. John Brown Jackson, oops, I didn't show you this picture. This is... Uh, John Jackson in the back there in a photograph that I think was probably taken about 1905, probably about a decade later than the other one. You see Nancy Jackson there again. She is significantly aged. She died in 1907 at the age of 92. Uh, on the left is Captain Bill's, Uncle Bill's wife, uh, who as I understand it, uh, had the rather interesting nickname of Aunt Looney. And, uh, and on the right is my great-grandmother, uh, Cordelia Jackson Barkley. But as I said, uh, Uncle John, John Brown Jackson, was born in 1845. 
This is a photograph that we suspect is from the early 1870s. It again shows my great-grandmother, significantly younger, his sister. And we are pretty sure that that's young, uh, still young John Jackson there, because he was not quite 17 when he joined the Confederate Army. Uh, he was born to my great-great-grandparents, Robert Jackson and Nancy Collar Jackson, as I've said. Our first reference to John is in a letter from September 1848 that I recently donated to the Tampa Bay History Center, a letter in which Robert Jackson, the elder, describes the great hurricane of that year and says, among other things, quote, my wife and youngest child, having five, have been very sick, uh, occasioned by exposure. I thought that I would have lost the child, unquote. But the child survived. And the next time we hear of John is in March 1862, when he was not quite 17 years old. And here we encounter an interesting reality of the Civil War era. Not every white person in the South was a secessionist, quite the contrary. Robert and Nancy Jackson were both unionists. Robert Jackson was from Philadelphia and New Jersey and had served in the garrison at Fort Brooke. There were other Unionists in Tampa as well, most prominently perhaps uh, Ossian Bingley Hart, uh, a native of Jacksonville but who was frequently present in Tampa where he had a law practice after 1856. He later became a Reconstruction era governor and was opposed to secession. Uh, many of you will know the work of Cantor Brown. He wrote a very fine biography of Ossian Bingley Hart. Thus, Robert and Nancy Jackson were strongly opposed to their son volunteering for Confederate service. Decades later, Nancy Jackson describes her response to the news of her son's uh, enrollment, if you will, enlistment in the Confederate Army. She writes, quote, or she says, quote, when my John enlisted with the Confederates, I thought that I could not have it so. His father was sick then, and I knew they were to be sworn in that day. I slipped out just from my own impulse with my sunbonnet on my head and went over or started to go over to where Captain Robert Thomas had the boys in camp. John was underage, only a schoolboy, and I was his mother and was going to forbid their taking him away. When I got near enough, I saw them all in line with their hands raised to be sworn in. I knew I was too late. I nearly fainted. I stopped where I was under a tree and finally got back home. Father saw that something was the matter with me as there were tears in my eyes and he said, Mama, that is what he always called me, what is the matter? I managed to tell him. He tried to comfort me, telling me he did not believe Thomas would have paid any attention to me if I had got there before they were sworn in, unquote. For those of you who might be dedicated Civil War buffs, much of what I'm about to say may seem pretty elementary. Although, as I keep saying, I'm a professional historian, this hobby took me into territories of research that were new to me. So I may sound a bit like an enthusiastic first semester graduate student setting out to write his or her first uh, graduate research paper. When I started to reconstruct Uncle John's life as my private hobby, one of the first sources I found was his compiled service record at the National Archives in Washington. We historians always like to look for what we call primary sources, and this one was a gold mine. There I found John B. Jackson's monthly record, showing his uninterrupted service as a private in Company K of the 7th Florida Regiment until November 1863 and resuming in February 1864. There I found another source, or then I found another source that nicely complemented the National Archives materials. Beginning in the 1890s, Confederate veterans were beginning to get old and infirm. But of course they could not count on getting veterans pensions from the US government given the fact that they had been in rebellion against that government. So the US government wasn't gonna give them anything. On the other hand, it's interesting that John's mother, uh, my great-great-grandmother Nancy Jackson, did continue to receive a U.S. pension as the widow of a Seminole War veteran until her death in 1907. 
Thus, the, faced by the fact that these, old guys, that these guys are getting old and infirm, the original Confederate states, including Florida, set up their own pension funds for Confederate veterans. Interestingly, Florida's are completely digitized and available online. The old soldiers, and this is the cover of one of them, one of John's, the old soldiers uh, had to fill out notarized applications with affidavits from their comrades saying, oh yes, this guy really did serve and he was in the battle of such and such and so on. And so, of course, they all signed off for each other. Um, <clears throat> which makes for a very interesting cluster of primary source material. John Jackson successfully applied for three Florida pensions, the last one you see here uh, in 1909. Finally, there is a plethora of printed primary material, uh, not only the famous official record series and the famous battles and leaders series, uh, but also more focused sources. There is a volume from 1899 called A Military History of Florida. Uh, from 1903, we find a reference volume called Soldiers of Florida in the Seminole Indian Civil and Spanish American Wars. And then there are also a number of secondary works and specialized monographs, uh, especially in recent years. There's been a kind of uh, surge in the, of, of publications about these matters in recent years. Two in particular influence me in my research. One is an excellent book by Jonathan Shepard called By the Noble Daring of Her Sons, the Florida Brigade in the Army of Tennessee. And the other is by Maurice Melton, A History of the Savannah Squadron of the Confederate Navy. In 1860, Florida had a total population of about 140,000, of whom about 62,000 were enslaved people, making it, in terms of population, the smallest state in the Confederacy. Of that number, about 15,000 served in the Confederate military, and of those 15,000, about 5,000 died, uh, a death rate of about a third. The seventh Florida, was officially constituted when the volunteers reached Gainesville in April 1862. The regiment was under the command of Colonel Madison Stark Perry, uh, who had just finished serving a term as Florida's governor and who was notable for his complete lack of any sort of military experience and it would seem, forgive me for making an editorial comment, intelligence. Uh, his deputy, whom we see on the right, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Bullock, came from Marion County, and he was rather more gifted as a military commander. Company K was originally composed of 72 officers, non-commissioned officers, and enlisted men. It included soldiers not only from Hillsborough County, but also a significant number of soldiers from Monroe County that is to say Key West, including a group who came up to Tampa and then to Gainesville who called themselves the Key West Avengers. The, uh, the company's commanding officer was Captain Robert B. Smith, uh, who was a farmer from Lafayette County in North Florida. And yes, it's Laf they pronounce it Lafayette. I know that because my other grandfather was from there. Um, he was, the, uh, he was the captain of, of, uh, of, the, reg of uh, the regiment, or the company, rather, I'm sorry. Uh, Private John B. Jackson was, of course, one of the enlisted men. It included a number of individuals who later played a role in the history of this area, as we shall shortly see. As I continued my early researches, I discovered that one of the sergeants in Company K was a man named Robert Watson, uh, a native of the Bahamas who had lived and worked as a carpenter in Key West for many years and then joined the Confederate Army. On one of my early visits to Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park, the chief historian showed me the manuscript of a diary that Watson had maintained from 1861 until the end of the war. <clears throat> 
Later on, this diary was considered sufficiently important to be published as a book uh, by the University of Tennessee Press. And it provides essential insights into the realities of a Florida soldier's daily life during the conflict. The 7th Florida was dispatched to Chattanooga in the summer of 1862 and thereafter participated continuously in the war in what was then called the West, by which they meant Tennessee and Kentucky and places like that. Not only was that war more mobile than in Northern Virginia, Confederate forces there also suffered, in contrast to Robert E. Lee's forces, from the continued mediocrity or even incompetence of many of its leading officers. Watson's diary recounts the daily hardships of an army composed of soldiers who were poorly clothed and poorly fed and basically had to forage off the countryside because their rations, as often as not, consisted of what he describes as sour cornbread. And I can only imagine what that tasted like. Um, in the summer of 1862, after arriving in Chattanooga, the 7th Florida and other Florida regiments participated in the ill-conceived and unsuccessful Confederate invasion of Kentucky, jointly led by Edmund Kirby Smith, himself a native of St. Augustine, and this man, Braxton Bragg, surely one of the most abysmally incompetent commanding officers in American history. Even before the recent renaming of military bases that had borne the name of Confederate officers, I often wondered why on earth Fort Bragg carried the name of this guy. Uh, but it did, and there we are. In entering Kentucky from eastern Tennessee, the Floridians had to march through mountains and through a mountain pass, something which most of them, as men from flatland Florida, had never experienced. Watson complains at great length in his diary about this and other privations, of course, as soldiers usually do. He noted that their uniforms were, quote, as coarse as corn sacks and looked like them. And, of course, they marched endlessly hither and thither without apparent rhyme or reason to the men. Having made it as far north as Lexington, Kentucky, the 7th Florida turned around and withdrew through the mountain passes back to eastern Tennessee. There in eastern Tennessee, they encountered, to get me back to my earlier point about the number of Unionists in the South, in eastern Tennessee, they encountered a hostile countryside that had remained rather staunchly Unionist. This brought them into contact with so-called bushwhackers, which were basically pro-Union guerrilla forces. They remained there guarding Knoxville, at a place called Strawberry Plains, and occasionally engaging in further skirmishes with Union forces. In fact, the 7th Florida generally fought its war as what were called skirmishers. That was their main function. In July 1863, they made a march to join Bragg's forces near Tullahoma, Tennessee, which were trying unsuccessfully to halt the advance of Union forces through Middle Tennessee, commanded by General William Rosecrans. I won't bore you with all the changes in organizational reassignments and all that stuff that Uncle John and the 7th Florida experienced, but after November 1862, they were officially part of Bragg's Army of Tennessee. Uh, marching through the heat with almost nothing for rations was very tough, as Watson noted. On one occasion in the summer of 1863, Watson writes, we fell in and started at 2 a.m. and marched all day through mud ankle deep and the hottest sun that I ever saw in my life. And that's something for a guy coming from Florida. Many of the men fainted and some were sunstruck. Several of them died. I was very much fatigued and exhausted and thought that I should faint several times, but we were on a retreat and must get out of the way of the Yankees or be taken prisoner, unquote. After then being sent back to far southwest Virginia, of all places, to defend strategically important salt works, the 7th Florida again returned uh, to eastern Tennessee. In September of 1863, the 7th Florida moved yet again, this time to northwest Georgia, just south of Chattanooga, close to a place called Chickamauga Creek. The Battle of Chickamauga fought over the 
next two days on the 19th and 20th of September was the second bloodiest of the Civil War after Gettysburg. It is now a part of Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park, the oldest such park in the country. It was originally intended in the 1890s not only to commemorate the battle, but also to train West Point cadets. As a result, it's one of the best marked battlefields in the country. This is, I don't know how well you can see this here, in the background is the Florida Monument. On the right is the base of the Florida Monument. As far as I know, and I may be wrong here, I, I don't think any monuments have yet been removed from any of the national military parks that are administered by the National Park Service. This is the Florida Monument again. The, on one occasion, while visiting the battlefield and after consulting the park historian, I said, I was taking this hobby pretty seriously at this point, I set out to walk the length of the battlefield following the route of the 7th Florida from opening shots near a place called Vineyard Field and from there on September the 20th, 1863 to a place called Horseshoe Ridge. Chickamauga was an especially horrific battle for several reasons. This is a lithograph, which is a kind of fantasy by a guy who was obviously not there. Uh, they, they didn't have hills like this there at the battle. Uh, this is a much more accurate portrayal by the uh, Civil War artist Alfred Waud, who was there on the occasion. Um, one of the things that made it notable is that in contrast to most Civil War battles, it took place mostly in heavily forested terrain with a few small farms and open areas. In the night, the battle for the forest caught fire and dozens of wounded on both sides uh, burned to death during the course of the night. These horrors have been brilliantly recounted in two harrowing and indeed terrifying short stories by two very distinguished American authors. One of them is Ambrose Bierce, who at that time was a Union officer serving in an Ohio unit and was there at the battle. The other by the great North Carolina author Thomas Wolfe. And they're both called simply Chickamauga. The Seventh Florida was engaged in especially fierce action on the after, late on the afternoon of September the 20th as disorganized Union forces mounted a last stand in a kind of semicircle around the heavily, uh, heavily wooded Horseshoe Ridge as it was called. Uh, the Union Army faced disaster, but it was largely rescued by this man, General George H. Thomas, who gained his uh, the nickname of the Rock of Chickamauga for his stout defense against the Confederate assaults. Uh, Thomas is an interesting guy because he was in many ways the opposite of Robert E. Lee. Uh, like Robert E. Lee, uh, Thomas was a native of Virginia, but when the war started, he opted to stay with the Union and became one of the most distinguished generals in the Union Army. But he was forever uh, on the outs with his family. Uh, his family disowned him, basically, and he was never able to make it up again. In any event, uh, this rather confusing map here, uh, if you can imagine, the, the, the Floridians are over there on the left, and what they do is they turn a so-called flank action up against Union forces on Horseshoe Ridge. This is what Horseshoe Ridge looks like now. The, uh, the seventh Florida, the sixth Florida and the seventh Florida had to charge through those woods you see on the left and then make a, a turn to the right to entrap uh, some rather desperate Union forces. The sixth and seventh Florida forced the surrender of the 89th Ohio and the 22nd Michigan regiments. The Rear guard action of those forces, as I said, helped to save the Union Army under Rosecrans from collapse. It escaped to the north to Chattanooga, where Braxton Bragg proceeded to lay siege to the Union forces. If you've been to uh, Chattanooga, you know the basic geography. We'll see a map in a minute. By this point, the 7th Florida had been reorganized along with other Florida uh, regiments and units into something called the Florida Brigade. <clears throat> 
And the commander of the Florida Brigade was Brigadier General Jesse J. Finley from Alachua County. Uh, until recently, there was a school and a park in Gainesville named after him, but again, after the George Floyd murder, uh, these were renamed as well. Um, President Lincoln decided he'd had enough and decided to bring in the big guns, the big guys, uh, to break the siege of Chattanooga. So he brings in General U.S. Grant himself to take charge of Union forces. After several weeks of maneuvering, and here's the map, you can see the uh, city of Chattanooga. For those of you who've been to Chattanooga, this is Lookout Mountain here. And to just to the east of the city is a long ridge called Missionary Ridge. And the Florida forces, Florida Brigade, including the 7th Florida, were right there, right in the middle of Missionary Ridge. Yes? right in the middle of uh, Missionary Ridge, uh, in rifle pits at the base of Missionary Ridge. Uh, on the 25th of November, 1863, on a very, very cold day, it was apparently an unseasonably cold autumn, the Floridians found themselves on the receiving end of one of the most audacious assaults in American history. As Union forces under the command of General Grant directly assaulted their positions. They were originally commanded just to move as far as the rifle pits at the base of the ridge, but in their enthusiasm, the Union forces, without orders from General Grant, decided to storm the ridge all the way to the top. Uh, as it happened then, Union forces poured over the Florida positions, the Floridians now had, along with, their, along with all the others, had to retreat in disarray up the hill. Here we see another rather imaginary depiction of the Battle of Missionary Ridge. This actually is an advertisement for McCormick Harvesters. So uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly accurate. Uh, these are, again, rather confusing maps. But imagine this is the ridge. And you see where it says Bragg? Uh, the Seventh Florida was directly in front of Bragg, more or less directly in front of Bragg's headquarters as they are being assaulted by Union forces. I don't know how well you can see this. This is from a painting which has now been destroyed, which is why we only have it in black and white. But it shows in the background is Bragg's headquarters and it shows the Union forces as they're proceeding up the hill. And with your permission, and I think we have time for this, I would like to in, um, go into a kind of a little sidebar parenthesis with an interesting story about this, if that's okay. Uh, one of the units that was charging up the ridge was directly to the left of the Florida Brigade, probably, I would estimate, 50, 60 yards or so from the Floridians. This unit was the 24th Wisconsin. The 24th, and that could actually be what we see here. The 24th Wisconsin roars over the rifle pits and begins charging up the hill to break up the Confederate forces that are uh, defending both the bottom and the top of the hill. The 24th Wisconsin came under very heavy fire. Two of the captains were killed. The flag bearer, every regiment in the Civil War had a flag bearer. The flag bearer was exhausted trying to climb up the hill because it's steep and there's rocks and he's under fire. He collapses and drops the flag. At that point, an 18-year-old lieutenant, a young man from, from uh, Milwaukee, picks up the American flag. He holds it up and encourages the regiment to keep on charging up the hill. And according to the official records, he actually did say, did shout, on Wisconsin. So. <laughs> Uh, they charge to the top of the hill, and now here's my little sidebar. The Floridians are off to their left there. Uh, we historians, when we go to graduate school, are always told by our professors that we should not engage in counterfactual history. <laughs> that is to say, what might have been, what if history, that kind of thing. We're always told, oh, no, no, that's intellectually irresponsible. You can't do that. But one of our dirty secrets is that every single one of us likes to do it. 
And so I'm going to engage with your forbearance for just a minute or two in counterfactual history. The 18-year-old lieutenant leads the 24th Wisconsin up the hill, and he reports later on that he's coming under such heavy fire that the flag itself is almost torn to shreds. But uh, he makes it to the top unscathed, and for his actions, he received the Medal of Honor. He, uh, now my, my counterfactual is this. Here we see him much later, much, much later in life. He's not 18 years old here. But my counterfactual is this. What might have happened had this young man um, been shot? Had Uncle John or one of his com comrades been better shots? What would have happened had he not made it? And specifically, the counterfactual question I am asking is, how might the history of World War II and the Korean War have changed? This young man's name was Arthur MacArthur. And this is his son, Douglas MacArthur, coming ashore in the Philippines in 1944. Well, in the chaos at Missionary Ridge, Large numbers of Floridians were captured along the way. Colonel Bullock, the commanding officer of the 7th Florida, was taken prisoner. Somebody else that John Jackson knew was a sergeant in the 3rd Florida, because they were all together now as part of the Florida Brigade. A sergeant in the 3rd Florida uh, was a man who was born in Great Britain, but had lived most of his life in Florida. A sergeant by the name of Samuel Pascoe after whom the county to our north is named. Robert Watson survived without injury, but could barely make it up the steep hillside. Uncle John, John B. Jackson, was shot in the back as he too was heading back up the hill. Somehow he avoided capture. Two days later, Watson wrote in his diary that John Jackson was one of a number of wounded. Watson writes, quote, our regiment lost a good many, including the colonel who was taken prisoner, cold and raining all night, unquote. Some years ago, I was driving through Macon, Georgia, and I stopped at the Washington Public Library there where I was able to consult the records of the Okmulgee Military Hospital, which was a Confederate military hospital. Those records are now available online. Uh, they weren't at the time, uh, so I had to consult them personally. And sure enough, I found there that on November the 29th, 1863, John B. Jackson was admitted along with dozens, dozens of other wounded veterans of Missionary Ridge. And they officially list him, his diagnosis, as gunshot wound in the back. Uh, within two months, however, he was back in his unit's winter camp in Dalton, Georgia. The rather useless Braxton Bragg had been replaced by the much more effective General Joseph E. Johnston. So Uncle John saw one more instance of combat with Company K on February 24th and 25th, 1864, a defensive action at Rocky Face Ridge near Dalton. If you drive south from Chattanooga on I-75, uh, you go right, right past it. Uh, this was a defensive action that began at sunrise and continued almost two days. Watson writes, quote, and his sympathies here are pretty apparent, so don't be bothered by this. About sunset, their sharpshooters opened on us, and they are still at it now. And the bullets are flying around me. Uh, fine style. Oops, there, a bullet has just grazed my head, so I must stop writing and go to shooting. Uh, then he goes on to say, the Yankees charged a high hill on our right, but our boys repulsed them handsomely with great slaughter. Tired and worn out as I was, it made my heart leap for joy to see the blue-coated devils run, unquote. <laughs> a few weeks later, though, something remarkable happened that changed John B. Jackson's life and that of dozens of his fellow Floridians dramatically. The next phase of my reconstruction of John B. Jackson's story uh, took me to the National Archive, I'm sorry, the National Civil War Naval Museum, which of all places is located in Columbus, Georgia. And the William W. Hunter papers at the Tulane University Library in New Orleans. 
On April 11, 1864, the headquarters of the Army of Tennessee issued a special order stating that 170 men in camp at Dalton were to be immediately transferred to the Confederate Navy. They were looking, the Confederate Navy was desperately short of manpower, obviously, and they wanted to get guys, I guess, from places that knew the water and how to work boats. So uh, John B. Jackson now was on the list, many of them from Company K, and two days later, they were on their way to Savannah to join the Savannah Squadron of the Confederate Navy. Uncle John went from being an infantry private to a so-called landsman, which was the lowest rank in any 19th century Navy. Watson had preceded him uh, a month before, largely through his intercession with an old friend of his. Watson had gotten to the Navy even earlier because he'd been sending petitions throughout the war to get into the Navy to his old friend from Key West, who was the Secretary of the Navy for the Confederacy. Uh, no, there's Missionary Ridge after the battle, a bunch of Confederate prisoners after the battle. Uh, Stephen Mallory was the Confederate Secretary of the Navy. Yeah, if you've been to uh, Key West, you've been to Mallory Square. Uh, it's named after him. So uh, Mallory orders all of these guys to go off to Savannah. John B. Jackson was first assigned to a small gunboat. That's the coastline. You see Savannah in the middle. To a small gunboat called the Sampson, which was a reconfigured, refurbished tugboat. And so not much of a gunboat. But on June the 3rd, 1864, John participated in one of the Naval War's more dramatic episodes, the seizure of a U.S. Navy blockading vessel off the coast of Savannah, or specifically off of Asaba Island, which is just to the south of Savannah. This uh, U.S. ship had the rather odd name of the USS Water Witch, uh, and here we see it, as you can see, it's a steamship with side, side paddle steam, steamship, steam vessel. In the dark early morning hours, seven small boats approached the unsuspecting water witch and boarded her. Uncle John was in boat number seven on the port side of the water witch. The alarmed crew of the water witch, of course, immediately opened fire on the boats as they were trying to board it. Uh, Boat six and seven both ran into that side paddle that you see there and crashed into the side paddle. And so the guys on board the ship simply began shooting down at them, uh, killing uh, one member of boat number seven and wounding several others, but miraculously Uncle John avoided injury this time. Uh, the Confederates seized the ship and took its crew prisoners, but they paid a heavy price. Their commanding officer was killed, as was their pilot. And if we have time toward the end, I can tell you something very interesting about the pilot as well. After the Water Witch incident, John Jackson was transferred to yet another gunboat. This one called the USS Macon, another refurbished old tub, uh, which carried six guns. He was part of a crew of 17 officers and 83 enlisted men. In December of 1864, I don't know, how they all fit under that thing. But in December of 1864, the Macon found itself defending Savannah from the assault of General William Tecumseh Sherman's forces at the end of the march to the sea. Uh, on December the 12th, 1864, the Macon and the Sampson were engaged in a really weird battle. I don't know how well you can see this map. There's Savannah down there. See that little black thing? And then upriver, you see that arrow? There's a place called Argyle Island. And there the Macon and the Samson fought a really weird battle as two gunboats fighting an artillery battle with land-based artillery forces from Sherman's army shooting at them. Uh, the Macon took two direct hits from Union cannon, after which uh, the captain decided that discretion really was the better part of valor. And since the ship was not exactly seaworthy, the only thing that they could do was sail as far as they could up the Savannah River to try to get away from northern forces. So they went as far as they could to the head of navigation at Augusta. And there they remained until the end of the war. And of course, in those days, there were no golf courses for them to play. So they, they had to hang around, I guess. We actually have a pretty complete record of these months. 
during which almost nothing happened. Um, the Macon itself, a rather doubtful old tub, quite literally rotted away. A number of members of the crew simply deserted. They disappeared. Uh, Uncle John was reported in the ship's log as ill but recovering on December 19th. And in January 1865, he's reported as back and presumably healthy. In May 1865, he surrendered along with the rest of the crew, was paroled. And that's almost the last we hear of John B. Jackson. I have no idea how he returned to Tampa. Perhaps he was able to hitch a ride on a boat going down the river to Savannah and then by boat to Tampa, because of course there were no railroads to Tampa at that point. And in any case, Southern railroads had been badly wrecked. Perhaps he walked. He'd been walking a lot. He was 20 years old. I also have no idea when he took up residence in his shack at Rocky Point. Uh, I have looked at U.S. Census records, but they're not terribly helpful. The, for one thing, they get his birth date wrong. They get the birth dates of his brothers wrong, too. Um, and they also show him in 1900 living at 205 Platt Street, uh, his mother's address, which, where he certainly did not live. Um, we do know from an obituary and various columns that were written decades later by D.B. McKay in his famous Pioneer Florida series, uh, that indeed, as my grandfather told me, John B. Jackson was a very prodigious angler. When he died in March 1921, John B. Jackson left an estate of $1,083.29 in the Bank of West Tampa and $132.83 in cash. In addition, his estate received $165 from A.W. Baxley for his hogs. Uh, of his heirs, my grandfather received $849, far more than any of the other relatives, and so maybe that's one reason why he was his favorite uncle. Um, the Tampa Morning Tribune's obituary on April the 1st, 1921 reported, and I quote, John B. Jackson, better known throughout the section as Uncle John, one of Tampa's best-known citizens, passed away at his home at Rocky Point yesterday morning about 2.30 o'clock. The obituary reported the cause of death as, quote, an attack of acute indigestion, unquote. But I did look up his, I did find his death certificate, and the death certificate said apoplexy, uh, which is what they called a stroke in those days. Uh, his honorary pallbearers included some well-known Tampa names, including D.B. Givens, Tom Keller, A.J. Smith, D.B. McKay, Judge J.E. Crane, Charles C. Spencer, and the obituary said, any member of the United Confederate Veterans who wished to volunteer could also be an honorary pallbearer. Because it turns out that John B. Jackson had been apparently a rather active member of that group. Very briefly, some of Uncle John's former comrades in arms from Company K played important roles in Hillsborough County, including West Hillsboro, or what became, there he is again, I'm get, getting ahead of myself, and there is where he's buried at Oaklawn Cemetery uh, with the rest of the Jacksons. But some of his former comrades in arms, as I said, from Company K, played important roles, among other things, in West Hillsboro. These are two examples. This is what became, of course, Pinellas County in 1912. Uh, on the left is Lieutenant John A. Bethel, who lived for many years at Pinellas Point and published an early history of that area in 1914. The man on the right is really quite interesting. His name was Sergeant John T. Lowe. Like Watson, he was a native of the Bahamas. He had lived in Key West for a number of years where he was a so-called wrecker. You know what they were. These are the guys who went out after ships that were being shipwrecked and basically grabbed the stuff. Uh, but in 1859, he moved with his family to the Gulf Coast side of the Pinellas Peninsula and in uh, 1862 joined the rest of the 7th Florida Regiment. Uh, after the war, uh, Lowe built a landing called Lowe's Landing, 
which included citrus production and coastal shipping and that kind of thing. Ultimately, uh, his little community led to the development of a small community, or his little efforts led to the development of a small community called Anona, which is now part of Largo. In 1872, Lowe donated some of his land to a new church, which opened in 1873 and is now Anona United Methodist Church, which just had its uh, 150th anniversary last year. Uh, and the Lowe House is still around. Uh, it has been moved on various occasions, but you can now visit it at Heritage Village in Largo, a wonderful open-air museum, which I strongly recommend to all of you. Well, I've gone on way too long with the what part of this. I'll be a whole lot shorter with the why and so what, even though those are the most interesting parts. What do we make of all this? So far, I've devoted probably way too much attention, as I just said, to the what part. But let's go to the why. Why did John and others like him fight? Well, I can't say for sure. I can only engage in conjecture. Our best two guides to this question are two books by two great historians of that era. One, James McPherson, who is a very distinguished historian of Civil War history. He wrote an important little book, but a very important one, called For Cause and Comrades, Why Men Fought in the Civil War. And the other is a historian, another great historian named Bertram Wyatt Brown. Uh, who taught for many years at the University of Florida and who wrote a very important book on the cult of honor in the antebellum South. We can assume, I think, that the not yet 17-year-old John Jackson, having grown up in Tampa in the 1850s, was not terribly sophisticated politically uh, when he enlisted against his parents' wishes. One might assume that there was a great deal of peer pressure to conform and that once serving, he was motivated by powerful feelings of the defense of home and above all of demonstrating uh, his own honor by showing courage. As Wyatt Brown points out in his book, in the 19th century, in the United, uh, throughout the entire United States, but especially in the South, there was this notion that honor is incredibly important to any male and that you can lose your honor, you can become dishonored by showing cowardice. And so the word courage becomes extraordinarily important to these guys. You all know that famous book by Stephen Crane, The Red Badge of Courage. Uh, that word was, was chosen by Crane on purpose. Uh, according to McPherson and to Wyatt Brown, these are all powerful motivators. But there may have been some unique aspects of Company K which distinguish it from others. They weren't all alike. For example, as several historians have pointed out, in 1863, many Confederate units experienced religious revivals. And the Seventh Florida was no exception. I have no idea what Uncle John's religious views were, except that he had been brought up as a Methodist. And in later years, his family here was active in what is now the Hyde Park United Methodist Church. Uh, there's even a Jackson family stained glass window there at the church. Um, but Sergeant Watson was decidedly hostile to the revival movement, and he hinted that Company K at large shared his hostility. Uh, in August of 1863, Sergeant Watson writes, quote, There is a revival going on in the regiment, and half of them are being converted, which makes it better for us, as they will not now go out so often after potatoes, etc. And our boys will stand a better chance to get more. For the psalm-singing hypocrites will be afraid of being found out and being expelled from church. The preacher is a regular snorter and can be heard for, for miles off yelling out hellfire and brimstone, which just suits the crackers. A good, sensible preacher could not get along with them. Our company has always been looked upon as uh, hard cases, but I suppose we will now be called the ungodly company. But we don't care a fig for any of them, for we beat them in everything that we undertake. And they all know it, yet we are all on friendly terms." Unquote. Uh, well, many Confederate soldiers, of course, and now we get some important points that have to be borne in mind, defended what they, shall we say, rather euphemistically called, quote, Southern institutions. By which, of course, they meant slavery 
and the bondage of human beings. And in this respect, and again, I'm just guessing, John Jackson might well have adhered to the conventional views of his comrades and of his generation. Even when, like John's parents, they were not themselves enslavers. It was a different matter with his grandfather. But one can generally assume that they adhered to the racial hierarchies and prejudices of those years. Probably unquestioningly. As we have just seen, an act, uh, John Jackson was an active member of the United Confederate Veterans. And we can conjecture that he might well have been present in 1911, and I hope you're not bothered by what I'm about to show you, that he might well have been present in 1911 at the dedication of Hillsborough County's Confederate Monument, which was attended by about 5,000 people, at which the main speaker, State Attorney Herbert S. Phillips, delivered a horribly racist speech, which I won't bother to quote because it is so offensive. Here we see, you all know this, this is where it used to be and where it now is. So if we can answer the, oh, and this is another interesting point. Uh, the, regardless of what you might think of it, the Hillsborough County Monument I've always thought is iconographically more interesting than your standard issue Confederate monument. Most, many, many Confederate monuments were built by the United, at, under the sponsorship of the United Daughters of the Confederacy around 1911 on the 50th anniversary of the war. And many of them are pretty generic. This is the one on the right, which used to stand, it has been removed, I believe, uh, in Munn Park in Lakeland. And, uh, but the soldier on top was fairly standard issue. Those, got, those soldier representations were largely kind of mass produced and sold throughout the South, which is why they tend to look alike. But the, Confederate, the, the one in Hillsborough County is more interesting because it shows a young man and he's pointing to the, he's marching toward the north and looking all confident of victory on the left and on the right you see him with his head bandaged and his head turned down in defeat uh, coming south. And so I've always thought that this was at least a, a more interesting aspect of this monument unlike the more generic ones. Um, we now come finally, at long last, I'm getting toward the end of my remarks. We're getting to the so what part. What do we make of all this? As I said at the outset, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans have Uncle John's in their family trees. People who fought for the Confederacy, who fought to break up the United States, and who fought to defend what they called Southern institutions. That is to say, slavery, the preservation of racial hierarchies, and human bondage. Now, of course, John B. Jackson could hardly be described as notable in any way, and certainly he was a very minor player in our country's great tragedy. The Civil War was one of the bloodiest wars globally in the entire 19th century. There are still disputes about the number of Americans who were killed in the Civil War, or who died, many of them from, probably most of them, from disease. Uh, the estimates these days vary between 620,000 and 750,000. If you project that to today's population of the United States, that would be the equivalent of, uh, six and a, uh, of uh, 620,000,000 uh, 600, to about 7.5 million relative to the population. But this story can lead us to reflect on what we mean by history, especially in the context of very recent debates that are still very much on the front burner and still arouse considerable emotions all of which reminds us of William Faulkner's very famous comment that the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. As we have seen in recent weeks, as the Florida legislature decides on what to do about old monuments, and we, and as we as a nation, continue to debate what kind of history we teach, a debate that has so far shed rather more heat than light, I fear. Of course, a lot of this concerns what political scientists call symbolic politics, a form of politics that can often arouse intense feeling and emotion, again, as we have seen so often in recent years. Um, if any of you are history majors, the chances are that you were required to read a classic book by a British historian named Edward Hallett Carr called What is History? In this book, he comes up with different definitions of history, but the one I think is the best is that history is a continuing dialogue between the societies of the past 
and the societies of the present. And as that dialogue itself changes, so too does our understanding of the past and our interpretation of it. I always used to tell my students that they should not believe anybody who talks about the so-called judgment of history. Whenever any politician gets up and says, history will judge me and show that I'm right, don't believe that person because with a few exceptions, history never makes final judgments. It's always a continuing dialogue. In the case of figuring out how we deal with our Confederate ancestors like Uncle John, an important point has to be made, and that is the centrality after about, really, 1877, of lost cause mythology in the larger context of institutionalized Jim Crow, and among historians, the long dominance of something called the Dunning School. Uh, I uh, rehearsed this talk a couple of times, and inevitably it's turning out to be longer than when I rehearsed it. So I will quickly, I'm going to skip over some parts here, but I can go back to them if you'd like. I was also going to talk about something called the Dunning School, which was a school of historical analysis of Reconstruction that has largely been discredited. Uh, to, get back, to get very briefly to my own field of German history, and bearing in mind that historical analogies are always problematic, it has always seemed to me that the uh, mythology of the lost cause bears certain resemblances to the so-called stab-in-the-back legend in Germany after World War I, a form of cultural defiance and an excuse for that country's defeat in 1918 and one of many factors that contributed to the collapse of German democracy in 19. 33. Uh, this is a print from around 1900 which evokes, I think, lost cause sentimentality and mythology. You probably can't see it terribly well. It says, our heroes and our flags. And in the middle of it, you see, of course, General Lee at the top, Jefferson Davis, and then all the different Confederate flags and then portraits of assorted Confederate generals. A lot of the lost cause mythology also took place, ironically and enough, in the context of reconciliation between northern and southern veterans, um, which of course is in and of itself a good thing, but it took place at the cost of, among other things, a generalized acceptance of and continuance of Jim Crow uh, by veterans from both sides. And of course, the uh, the uh, reconciliation between both sides is sort of indicated here. This is a citrus uh, package from, I actually remember Milno Berry Packing Company in St. Petersburg, but here we see blue and gray oranges and grapefruits. So, um, as I have said, uh, it seems to me that, and I'll conclude, I really will conclude on this point. Um, as for monuments, I don't have a simple solution, and I suppose I'm a bit wishy-washy on the subject. Again, we can look at Germany. Like many European countries, Europe, uh, Germany has lots of monuments to the 1914-18 war, but very, very few, obviously, to the German dead of the war of 1939 to 1945. And the ones that exist tend to be very understated, mourning young men who died needlessly in a criminal war. I also don't believe in erasing the past and quite literal iconoclasm, that is to say the destruction of visual representations, can sometimes lead to unsettling extremes as we saw a few years ago in Madison, Wisconsin. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the destruction of the famous statue there on the grounds of the state capitol. You have a couple minutes? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm blathering on, I don't want to go too long, because I want to hear from you. Um, a couple years ago, in the wake of the George Floyd murder, an angry crowd went to the grounds of the state capitol in Madison, and there they tore down and destroyed and symbolically beheaded uh, the statue of a man named Hans Christian Haig. And then they threw the remainder of the, uh, of the uh, statue into a lake, one of the nearby many lakes there. Well, Hans Christian Haig was an immigrant from Norway, a dedicated abolitionist who had dedicated his life in the United States to the end of slavery. He had volunteered for the Union Army 
and was himself killed in combat at Chickamauga. And it was his statue that was, they've, they've, they've rebuilt it and it's standing there again. But that is an example, that, that is an isolated example to be sure, but an example of, of how sometimes these things can go to extremes. As you may know, the Baltic nations plus Poland and the Czech Republic have recently been busy tearing down post-1945 Soviet-era monuments in their countries, which has aroused the intense ire of Vladimir Putin, as you can well imagine. Uh, controversies about monuments have been around for a long time and are often, and are thus global affairs. I have always rather liked what the Hungarians did after 1989 with their old communist statues and monuments, they simply took them all down and put them in a park, a kind of open air history park, where you can go visit them and you can look at Lenin and Stalin and all the rest of them and kind of visit it and point at them and then go home. As we look at the Uncle Johns of our pasts and try to figure out the historical legacies of our ancestors and how we haven't come to terms with it, we can perhaps be reminded of what one essayist recently wrote. She notes that, quote, the point of re-examining the past is not to find new people to chastise or commemorate, but to deepen and complicate our understanding of ideas, institutions, incidents, and individuals to make us newly alive to the messiness and contingency of the past and present alike." Unquote. And so, as we reflect at Longland, I finally come to an end, as we reflect on our Confederate ancestors like John B. Jackson, we might look to the example of this man. General James Longstreet, one of Robert E. Lee's most stalwart corps commanders, a man uh, whom the hapless Bragg borrowed in 1863 to help him win at Chickamauga. After the war, Longstreet was reviled for the rest of his life in the South because he became a Republican and supported Reconstruction governments. Now, he was no plaster saint, and he most certainly did not inhabit the world of 2024 in terms of his values. We always have to avoid what we call the fallacy of anachronism. That is to say, judging the past by the values and outlooks of the present. Bearing that in mind, bearing in mind even an obvious notion like being careful with that sort of thing, it is interesting to consider the career of James Longstreet after 1865. Because it does seem that Longstreet's willingness to embrace emancipation and equal rights for black people was remarkable in the context of his time, even if he was no plaster saint. And so my final words come from Longstreet, only a few years after the war, and I think they still deserve reflection and attention. Longstreet wrote, and I quote, if the last funeral rites of the Southern Confederacy have not been performed, let us with due solemnity proceed to the discharge of that painful duty and let us deposit in the same grave the agony of our grief that we may the better prepare ourselves for a return to the duties of this life." Unquote. Well, that's all I have. Thank you very much and I'll, I'm sorry I've... Uh... I've gone longer than I promised. <laughs>